Welcome everyone to Beyond Surviving, the safe space for survivors of childhood sexual abuse to receive support, resources, and share their stories. Beyond Surviving is about freedom, healing, connection, and even laughter and fun. Most importantly, it's about letting go of the pain of abuse and finally moving on. I'm Rachel Grant, and for those of you who don't yet know me, I've been a sexual abuse recovery coach since 2007, and I'm the author of Beyond Surviving, The Final Stage of Recovery from Sexual Abuse. You can learn more about me and the Beyond Surviving program at rachelgrantcoaching.com. Now, today, we are so, so very lucky to have with us Roland Ball, who is going to be sharing with us about how we can resolve complex trauma and PTSD, and we're also going to be exploring the process of dissociation. So I want to tell you a little bit about Roland. He's actually originally from Holland, but currently lives in Spain, Barcelona. I am so very jealous, <laughs> and uh, he has gone through a transition from osteopathic body work to working with psychological trauma only. Roland and I have a lot in common. He uses cognitive and somatic body-based psychotherapeutic approaches to effectively treat complex trauma and PTSD. I really wanted Roland to come on the show today to bring in his work around somatics. I get into that a little bit. I'm getting into it more and more, um, but I'm really looking forward to his perspective about how we can use somatics to treat um, you know, these symptoms that we have as survivors of trauma. His approach focuses on regulating, processing, containing the processes of dissociation, including that fight, flight, freeze, please response, and relearning boundaries and vulnerability. And that's just a nutshell. You know, he's doing a lot more stuff as well. So we are so lucky to have him here with us. And I can't wait to enjoy this conversation today. Roland, welcome. Thanks so much for being here. Yeah, welcome. Thanks for having me. So I want to jump right in. I'm so curious to know um, what, in t what, what all of this entails when we're talking about the process of dissociation. This is a word that is thrown around a lot in the world of healing and trauma. People get all, I'm dissociating, I'm dissociating now, oh, I'm dissociating again. It might be overused, I think, in some ways. Mm -hmm. And I think that happens because people don't have a really clear understanding of what it actually is, what it entails, and how it applies to those of us who have experienced trauma. So let's start there. What are your thoughts about that? Sounds good. I think, yeah, as I, you already mentioned, I've called it the process of dissociation rather than dissociation as a final destination. So there are different levels of how you kind of fragment in order to survive or dissociate. And so you go through an overwhelming experience that usually has one dominant emotion present for you, be it anger, fear, or sadness. And often that emotion in itself is already too much to contain. So you kind of even push further out from that mm -hmm. into excessive thoughts, into addiction, and then finally into a more numb or free state, which you might call a more severe form of dissociation, which often goes together with uh, depression and chronic pain, feeling frozen, and so, yeah, that's what I refer to when I talk about the process of dissociation, that there are really different levels to it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And also you have to, as you work with complex trauma, sexual abuse, PTSD, you have to work through those different levels of dissociation. And so coming back from that dissociated state, which is excessive thoughts, kind of people live here rather than down here. Mm. or even kind of pushed out of the head, feeling outside of themselves, looking in from the outside. So uh, that process of healing is bringing oneself back again in the body and meeting those deeper levels of, of emotion, which are still alive and, and giving all the physical and emotional symptoms. Going in between basically fight, flight and please activation, and then going back into uh, the freeze or dissociating response. And that goes back and forth. Uh, you go into the excessive thoughts where guilt, blame, self regret shame, embarrassment, all these kind of processes that happen up here with excessive thoughts. Then you freeze, dissociate to a kind of more severe state. Then 
when the depression lasts for some time, at some point you fall back into feeling the body again for a while and being in the fight, flight, and please mode. So that's basically what complex PTSD or PTSD is. You go on and you go from on to like off and then back. Like exactly. Like a cycle that you're in. Okay. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah. All right. Thanks for for breaking that down a little bit. And, you know, one of the things that I've noticed in my work with survivors of abuse, and certainly I've experienced myself, are these levels of dissociation. And one of the things that um, I often explore is healthy dissociation. Like Mm. there is this place in which we kind of just space out sometimes, like the brain just takes a little break. (laughs) Mm. And now I don't know if you would actually categorize that under this, or when you think about levels of dissociation, if you would categorize Mm. spacing out as a low level, um, but that the brain is not active all of the time, right? We're not present 100% of the time. Mm-hmm. We space out, you know, we daydream, um, we get into our thoughts in our head, and then, but this process, that becomes exacerbated when we've had trauma and we have a harder time staying in our body or we're going through those cycles of being triggered, being activated, and then the system not being able to cope or handle that and going into that place of, you know, dissociation, kind of reaching those higher levels. Mm. You, anything you would add to that or, or change about what I said there? I think I use dissociation quite liberally. Like you said as well, there's a dissociation which can be healthy when you need to focus on a task at hand. You also block out certain other parts. So right. in a way you kind of concentrate or focus or fragment in order to yeah to order to get things done Mm -hmm. and so you can call that also a form of dissociation but in a healthy way and i think yeah i think even with emotions we have to look at all these things and kind of where where is it constructive and where is it destructive Mm -hmm. so you can have anger for example which i often relate to boundaries which i'm sure we're gonna kind of dig in a little bit more today when there's healthy anger when you express your yes when you express your no when you push back when you need to um setting your boundaries helps to counteract a lack of self-esteem re-establishes your self-worth so there's a healthy way of dealing with anger there's also a healthy way of dealing with sadness when there's healthy grief it's a it's very healing yes and it can be also a destructive way of dealing with anger when you hold it in it eats away your self-esteem your self-worth or when you become explosive with it, you push people away or uh, you break up relationships. Yeah. So I guess dissociation, you can look at it from two ways as well. It can be destructive or it can be constructive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And let's talk a little bit about the darker side of dissociation. Mm. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, one of the, one, why, why? Why do we want to learn to either... Well, this is a curiosity question. Do you think people actually can reach a place where they no longer dissociate in this way that's unhealthy? Can we learn to do that? Is that something that we want to acquire as a skill? Is that that even a possibility? And um, well, let's just start with that. What do you think about Mm. that? I think as you work on yourself, you build a more resilience and containment. Then again, I would keep yourself with healthy expectations that you're going to have stresses in your life. You're going to have ups and downs. So you'll have times where you're going to dissociate a bit. You're going to, yeah, you're going to fall back in some of your default patterns, no matter how much you've healed Mm -hmm. uh, your past wounds. And I think if you can kind of keep those expectations somewhat in check and kind of uh, what do you, how do you say it in English? Kind of roll with the punches. Sure. <laughs> yeah. If you can roll with the punches, then you can bring yourself back to containment and resilience much quicker. Yeah. Uh. I love that. Well, I think we'll talk more about this as we go along as well, but since it's kind of present here in our conversation now, mm. this is, I think, a big piece that I try to convey to those who, you know, who I'm working with, which is that there are kind of two goals in healing from trauma. One is in many ways decreasing our activation. How easily are we activated, right? Mm -hmm. How much of a live wire are we, in other words? And then also having a higher resiliency so that that activation doesn't happen as often. And if it does, 
being able to bounce back quickly, feeling mm. equipped, like you have a set of tools and processes and strategies that you know that you can rely on that are going to bring you back into that, I like what you call it sometimes containment <laughs> or alignment, you know, settle down already. And so, yeah, we need to have that feeling of, that we can do that so that, you know, we feel empowered even in the face of Exactly as you say, life happens, stressors come, unexpected things arise, and how do we take care of ourselves in those moments? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how did Very you even... Important, yeah. yeah. Just uh, I'd like to add a little oh, bit please. to that. Yeah. I think a few things that help when, with coming back to containment is, I mean, there's obviously the working on your past emotion. I usually call it emotional residue, it kind of resonates with me. So working on your past wounds and bringing them to some kind of resolution. But also not to fall into all patterns, what helps is to kind of rearrange how you have organized your life. So having to move away from an abusive situation, abusive people, forming new relationships. So all those things help to not relate to your past kind of coping patterns too much mm -hmm. and to keep them at bay as much as possible because you want to kind of start to relate to another part of you where the the pain doesn't live yes and so that includes people that includes new activities that includes following your passions mm -hmm. uh, that I comes that so much uh, mm, and i think that comes in the later stage of healing first of all well, yes and no. I mean, uh, removing yourself from an abusive environment is very necessary before you start to heal. Mm -hmm. uh, but following your passions comes a bit later. First, you might have to deal with what holds you back and what traps your energy before you yeah. kind of can move into that. Yeah, it's such an important thing. Um, I was, oh gosh, I'm forgetting his last name. I think it's Salinas, but Joel, um, he's a neuroscience scientist or neurologist. And uh, he was recently speaking at a conference and talking about how the brain is very much impacted by our environment. And at the beautiful opportunity is as our environments change, the brain can change and adapt mm -hmm. to those new environments. And I think you're onto something here that if we're in an abusive environment, uh, not that healing work can't happen, but you've got a little more of an uphill climb because, mm -hmm. you know, and I experienced this very personally when um, I was in a, a 10 year relationship that was very abusive verbally and physically. And I was trying to work on, you know, the sexual wounding, you know, and the sexual abuse from my grandfather. And it, and then I would come home into a space where all of those fears that I was dealing with and all those beliefs that I was dealing with as a result of past trauma were almost being reiterated and in the present moment, right? Mm -hmm. And so it was very hard. And, and truth be told, the real um, impetus of my healing and my growth and change happened after that after I divorced and I was out of that situation, I finally had the space to really step in to fuller healing mm. and take the and time the energy. Mm. that and the energy that's right. And that's what really set me off in my course. And, you know, here I am today. What set you off into your core, into your path? Mm. Like, how did you arrive here to be doing this work and to right. have such a passion and care for for helping those who've mm. experienced trauma i think i have a few different stories to that question i started with osteopathic work and i worked a long time with kind of the body physically and the more subtle areas of working with the body and uh, i could see that when there was a lot of emotional stuff going on for those people i was working with a problem a physical problem or tension would shift but it wouldn't necessarily resolve and so I got more interested into, okay, what's really happening there? What, what am I missing or what do I need to deepen that I'm actually addressing not just the symptom, but more the cause of what the body shows, which is chronic pain very often. Mm -hmm. And so I got more interested in delving into the psychological part, working with the emotions, the trauma. And so that kind of from a more structural point of view, that set me off and exploring more that area. Mm. Um, then probably from a more personal point of view or from a deeper incentive, in my late teens, in my early 20s, I suffered from quite a bit of anxiety and depression myself. And 
based on um, suppressed anger and uh, some kind of developmental traumas I've been dealing with. And that kind of set the stage initially for um, kind of working on myself and also exploring body work and healing myself as much as I can. Mm -hmm. um, it's a really wonderful thing. You know, so many of my clients, uh, you know, they are experiencing chronic pain. They have, you know, fibromyalgia or mm -hmm. chronic fatigue syndrome or, and, and as we begin to more and more understand the correlation between these symptoms, that those are actually symptoms, not the actual disorders in some ways, if you frame it mm -hmm. that way, and that the, the root of the problem is this unresolved trauma. Mm -hmm. So I give ma major props to you. I think there's a lot of work that's happening now in the medical field and in those areas where it has traditionally been um, looking at you know pain mm. as what needs to be treated and people are beginning to understand more and more that what needs to be treated is the underlying cause which is mm. that trauma mm. and so it's amazing that you caught on to that and made that transition and yeah you know i think we all have those personal motivations as well like when we've experienced pain or anxiety or depression and struggled then you know we have that place in our hearts where we want to really mm. step in and, and walk alongside other people mm. in that journey. Mm. One of the other things that you've talked about and, and that you work on quite intentionally is our boundaries. And mm. um, so I'd love to hear your personal definition of what a boundary mm. is. I think mm. everybody has different ideas about that. And right. so, yeah, how would you even just simply define what a boundary even is? I put it in as simple terms as possible. Are you able to express your yes? And are you able to express your no? Mm -hmm. And so that really sums it up really. And like when I work with clients, I use that as little exercises. For example, when they can't express the yes or no, even in a therapeutic setting, I ask them to put a hand in front of them like that. And I say, mm -hmm. okay, can you close your eyes and see how that feels? And very often for people who are really abused, it's already very challenging to do that because this is kind of um, a semantic expression of back yeah. off or I'm holding my space. And when that's not been allowed when you were young as a child, when you've gone through a lot of child abuse, just the act of doing that with your hand already brings up a lot of anxiety. Mm -hmm. And so very often you don't have to start with boundaries. You can use boundaries, but then what comes up is that pleasing response or the yeah. anxiety that kind of overrides the setting of relearning of boundaries. Yeah. So you kind of delve in a little bit into working with boundaries, but then you see that, oh, I'll have to be really careful and not push for relearning those boundaries, but first also take on board the anxiety that comes up or the mm -hmm. pleasing response. And the yeah. pleasing response is like, a, I have to adapt to my environment in order to not be more abused. So. I submit, I hold, hold back, I start to please. And so again, you come back, you come into that feel of a collapsed sense of self-worth, self-esteem mm -hmm. and uh, a non-existence of boundaries. And so I'm, I'm taking one direction now with explaining a little bit how you can work with boundaries, but with severe neglect and the pleasing response that flows out of it, you have to be very careful with setting boundaries. And then bit by bit, as you express your boundaries, and that can be uh, somatically through holding a hand up, or it could even be crossing your arms and holding your space. Okay. Then a little bit further in the process, you might actually say, uh, back off, or I'm really angry, or you might express it to your abuser, like, I don't want this, or go, go away. And so you work with different kind of intensities of anger to reestablish anger. Mm -hmm. And that brings back a sense of self-esteem, sense of self-worth, and also empowerment. And that all goes together, healthy boundaries, suppressed anger, self-esteem, self-worth, and then empowerment or having the will to actually move things again in your life. Mm -hmm. So boundaries are so vital in the healing process. And again, it's a word that's been thrown out there so easily, boundaries, but there's a lot of different complexities that relate to boundaries. 
I so agree. And I think it's really wonderful the the kind of association that you're setting between setting boundaries and coming back into a place of an empowered no and an empowered yes. Sometimes people think that boundaries are always in the negative, right? Mm. <laughs> it's the things that you don't want. And mm. that's a boundary. The boundaries yeah. are also the things I do want yeah. and the things that I am a yes to. Those mm. count as well. Yeah. And absolutely coming out of this people pleasing. Oh, my goodness. You know, mm. I think every single client I work with has on mm. some level this people pleasing behavior. Mm. Mm. And you're absolutely right. It's a way that we survive. You know, we become mm. adaptive. And this is in some ways a superpower because this is also why survivors of trauma often are able to empathize with lots of different kinds of people. They're able to connect with lots of different kinds of people. This because they have it's, it's a strength, but it becomes a weakness when it means we're constantly sacrificing ourselves when we're not able to hold those boundaries mm. with other people. And I loved what you were saying there about how even just using the physicality, like what a representation, a physical representation of no, like a hand out in front of you or crossing your arms, when we can't find the language sometimes, yeah. especially mm. because of that anxiety mm. and the activation that starts to happen, because this is unfamiliar territory. It's uncomfortable. We've been trained that, you know, mm -hmm. if you stand up for yourself, something bad is going to happen potentially. For many people, that's the case. And so using those somatic responses to work through the anxiety about it, even guilt. Some of my clients talk about feeling guilty about mm -hmm. setting boundaries, like they're doing mm -hmm. something bad or wrong. And so yeah. reframing all of that and coming back into ownership of that is so critical to being able mm -hmm. to heal for sure. Hmm. Can you I would even I would even say flight sometimes is a way of setting boundaries as well mm. when you don't have the when you don't have the empowerment to deal with the situation it's worse to become stagnant and stay stuck it's better to even remove yourself from an environment yeah. and sometimes people like you say they go into guilt or blame with that but I think flight in certain situations when you don't have the empowerment yet at least you keep some sense of integrity so yeah. i would even put that in certain situations as part of a healthy boundaries response yeah and get out I, of dodge do you know that expression no, I, don't. <laughs> yeah. I don't know where dodge is but you're supposed to get out of it um it's just yeah. one of those euphemisms like you know run away get out of here mm. um mm. take a break and mm. Yeah, I think that's really spot on, Roland, that, the, yeah. that these are actually ways that we can sometimes use these activated responses, these stress responses to our benefit. It's mm. not always a bad thing that's happening. Mm. Like use it when you need it in that way. That's a really exactly. great idea. Yeah. And then I, I marry boundaries and vulnerability together. Uh, yeah. They go together that you need healthy vulnerability, but you also need healthy boundaries. You need the two together and they work in tandem with each other. So you'll have to relearn with whom it's safe to open up, with whom it's safe to share. And then you also have to be aware with whom kind of you have to set your yes and no and keep them out. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have your vulnerability in the right place, you open up too soon, too quick with somebody who might take advantage of you which very often happens when your default is already a pleasing response so and you trust too quick. And then that sets the stage for reenactment. Like the pleaser attracts a narcissist very often. Right. So you reenact your past patterns. That's and it. so you need both. You need to be able to kind of tap into your vulnerability and heal the wounds there. But at the same time, you need your boundaries in place to kind of protect your vulnerability with whom it's safe to open up and with whom it's kind of you have to hold back or keep them out or keep them at a distance. And it can be a tough lesson because sometimes it's with kind of family members that you have to keep them at a good distance. So right. again, not to get triggered again, not to refer to your old coping strategies and patterns too much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, this is such an important piece that we're discussing here because when we are not taking care of ourselves in that way by setting those boundaries and stepping away there are so many um expectations that people will put on us or that we might put on ourselves oh it's family i should go to that birthday party right i should do that thing and even when we begin to recognize that those that 
being there is actually to put ourselves in a toxic situation people will feel guilty and i sometimes use the analogy like if you were you know standing outside of a room and you know i told you inside this room is just like the worst noxious gas ever and as soon as you step into that room you're just going to feel terrible would mm. you walk into that room <laughs> You know, and people are like, oh, well, no, I wouldn't do that to myself, but we will do that in relationships because of mm. all the expectations mm. and the shoulds. And so giving ourselves permission to not do that, to actually hold those boundaries, even with family members is super, super important for sure. Roland, I'm finding myself curious about how you work somatically. I'm wondering if you can share with us maybe a somatic tool that mm. people can use um, to address any of these things we've been talking about, maybe to work with that moment of feeling dissociated, what somatic mm -hmm. strategies or you know, exercises might you offer around that, or using somatics to deal with anxiety. Um, maybe mm. you have a couple of favorite little techniques that you'd like to share with us today. Sure, I can share a few things. I mean, I work with both the cognitive part and the somatic part. So uh, what we've been discussing is kind of the cognitive part, having insight into uh, your particular process of dissociation, how you've built up your own levels of dissociation. So first of all, I work with that to get an insight or a roadmap into those patterns. And then if I consider how I do sessions, there's always a part where I ask the person to close their eyes and just really start where they are, not to push for getting somewhere, not to push for relaxation. And so when you feel anxious or when you feel depressed or when you feel dissociated, can you start right there in this moment? And there's a feeling to those states. There's a feeling to anxiety. There's a feeling to depression. There's a feeling to dissociation. It sits in certain parts in the body. So it's just simple questions. Like I, I usually start with, if I can invite you to close your eyes, um, can you see where most of your energy is concentrated? And if they can't find the words, I say, is that your head or is that your throat area? Is that your chest area? Just so they get a sensation of where they're living, kind of energetically speaking. And then from there, just taking a deep breath to say, well, I feel I'm really busy in my thoughts. I might say, okay, what's the feeling of that busyness of your thoughts? Could you feel it as a sensation in the head? Does it give pressure? Does it give tension? Does it sit around your head or does it sit inside your head? And so the moment you shift it from being carried away by their thoughts and having to overcome or having to solve that problem, but you put the focus on what's happening in the here, in the now, that shifts that process away from duality into just observing what's happening in the moment. And so you take the mind out of a dual state and you bring it into what I call non-dual observation. Mm -hmm. And that already brings a certain calmness, it brings a certain presence, it brings a certain awareness to the here and now. Mm. And from there you take it deeper. You might start with feeling dissociated and I stay with that for, we stay with that for five or 10 minutes. And then as that dissociation starts to become a little bit more flexible, you might suddenly feel that anxiety comes to you or sadness comes to you. And so if they're able to voice, I usually pick it up and see it. Uh, but if they're able to voice it, then I'll pick it up from there. I say, okay, is that a familiar feeling to you? If you would take me back to your past, where that this similar feeling also for you was really present for you somewhere in the past, or which context or uh, with what kind of person or perhaps period in your life. And then from there, you take it a little bit deeper and you kind of keep asking questions as to okay, what's moving in your body right now? Where is it felt? Where is it safe for you to put a hand on your body where that feeling is being stayed up for you or where you feel triggered? And so bit by bit, you unravel those, what I already said, those processes of dissociation. You take them from the dissociation, depression, um, a bit deeper into the might, might be excessive thoughts or addictions, and then into the more core emotions. And um, you kind of shift in between talking about it and talking into it, which is the feeling part. 
Oh, I love that. Talking mm -hmm. about it to talking into it <laughs> or feeling into mm -hmm. it. Oh, mm -hmm. yes. I love that. There's a video um, that Roland did on excessive thinking. I'm not making that up, right? That's right. No, I did. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. yeah and I have it on my um, resource page. So if you go to Rachel Grant Coaching slash resources slash brain, um, you'll be able to find that that video that he's done and you can delve into this even a little bit more and be taken through a, a very specific process that, that Roland's been describing here today. What really stands out to me from what you shared there is how we can move from I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I'm thinking about something to locating what's the feeling that's there around that thought and then locating it in the body, connecting it into a space and a place in the body, and then feeling into that more and being with that. And by way of this, we, I, I love that we get out of this kind of rumination and we bring it into that present space and we can also practice connecting it back to a past moment. How'd I do? Did I get that right? Yeah, it's a good sign up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> cool. Roland, anything else that you want to share with our listeners today? Anything you want them to know for those who are on this path and are dealing with hmm. complex PTSD and all of these symptoms and, and this journey of healing? Hmm. Oh, so many things I can add to that. I think it's important to take your time, but also seek help when the time comes for it. When you feel ready, really reach out. When you work with somebody, one-on-one -on -one or even in group work or or online courses it really speeds up your process um yeah you have to focus on those boundaries and vulnerability what we talked about today to yeah bring that to a kind of integration new level work on those containment and resilience um, mm. issues um don't let money may become an issue for you i think it's more important to focus on intention and as you grow, uh, as you become more empowered, also money and relationships start to come to you again. And so I think that it's kind of a process too. You feel really dissociated, not able to move, and you just have to show up. You have to listen. Um, and then as you show up and listen, that dissociation starts to melt a little bit, and you come into the next stage. You still feel overwhelmed, but not so dissociated anymore. Yeah. And you have to work with the kind of what I call coping motions or dealing with excessive thoughts, anger, fear, and sadness, and bring that to a bit more containment, bring that to more resilience. And that again, it starts to give you more. It's like your energy that's stuck in those emotions in duality. Slowly on, they become either processed, they become released, or they become integrated. And then again, there's more energy available and you go to the next step where you start to integrate things in your life. And that also means that you have more financial income. You start to form better relationships, healthy relationships, which create synergy and also more energy. And then you're able maybe to work with somebody on an individual level. I know it costs a little bit more, but there's these kind of stages of recovery that you have to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Money is energy. I'm focusing a little bit on money because many people get stuck on that. They do, yeah. Money is energy, and you need to have enough energy to kind of lift yourself to the next step. Yep, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, so, Roland. I really um, dig that and appreciate the perspective of, first of all, we heal, we can accelerate our healing when we do it in um, collaboration with someone. Uh, so whether that is an online community or a coach or a therapist or whatever it might be, don't try to heal in isolation. It just doesn't work. <laughs> it uh, just does not work. And uh, this is a question that often comes up, you know, when people are seeking resources, survivors of abuse are often um, in financial struggles straights because of course it's hard to work or you mm. struggle you all these different things and the mindset of you know finding a way to invest in ourselves at whatever level we can like make the first best investment and then that's going to help you reclaim some energy and then you're going to have more vitality and more motivation and you can go to the next level and the next level um, I, I hear so often people say well when I finally have the money I will I'm like, man, like I get that and I've been in that place, but we okay. really need to try to find a way to flip that around, make mm. that investment and find a way to make that investment. And mm. then it's all, it's going to return tenfold. <laughs> you know, you're going to have that investment mm. back so quickly when your system is regulated, when you're healthy, when you're confident, mm. 
when you're empowered, you know, all of those things. I've seen that yeah. in my own life, mm. and certainly in the lives of so many of my clients. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah start with an open mind to start kind of move away from making a statement of I can't. It's like, okay, what can I do? Yeah. And so rather say, I can't because this or that. You say, okay, I might not be able to do this right now. What can I do right now? Yes. Like, okay, I can't invest in personal treatment, but I can dig into all the free stuff that is on certain websites that I resonate with. I can buy a bunch of books or ebooks. Uh, then maybe the next step is I can do some online work or be in a Facebook closed group or whatever. And then again, you kind of through the interaction, you already learn a lot. You have insights, you grow in your learning process, your healing process. Yes. And then when the time is ready, when you keep that intention steady in your focus, then at some point it will come to you. Yeah, mm. absolutely. So thank you so much for being here and being my guest today, Roland. I really love everything that you shared. And I want to um, make sure everybody knows how to get in touch with you. So you can email Roland at Roland at Roland Ball. That's just R-O-L-A-N-D-B-A-L.com. And you can, of course, check out his website, RolandBall.com. You work with folks um, all over the world. No. no matter where they are, right? So no, if, if what um, you're hearing from Roland today is resonating with you, no matter where you are in the world, feel free to reach out to him. Um, Roland also has a trauma essential ebook series, and you can get that at rolandball.com slash trauma dash essentials and all these links will be in the show notes so you all can go and look there there's also an audio course about trauma care and that's at rollandball.com slash trauma dash care so please go check out roland's resources get connected um, he has so many wonderful things on his website that you can take advantage of and certainly reach out to him for support and to learn more about how you can work together um, if you're feeling led to do so. Thank you everybody for tuning in and joining us today. Um, also remember you can visit rachelgrantcoaching.com to check out the resources that are available there and learn more about sexual abuse recovery coaching. And please be sure to subscribe to our podcast. Leave us a note if you like what you're hearing. Don't leave us a note if you don't like what you're hearing. <laughs> And then come back next time because we have so much more to share. Until then, take good care of you.